Welcome to Ash 2022. This is the first in a series of videos that I'm going to put out about the biggest and best abstracts at Ash. And if you have suggestions, you can go ahead and email plenary session podcast at gmail.com. Today, I'm going to be talking about Telquetamab, a T cell directing GPRC 5D bispecific antibody for my favorite disease, multiple myeloma. In the last few weeks, plenary session has done a couple of very interesting videos on myeloma. We featured the Raj Kumar Goodman debate about should I treat smoldering? And also, I gave a talk to the UK myeloma group. I have just had a chance to read this paper. I've read the supplement. This is the first of hopefully many abstracts that I'm going to be bringing you in these amateur videos that are not produced with my usual setup. So please forgive that. All right, let's get into it, GPRC 5D. But first, two announcements. Number one, don't hang a bag on my door full of garbage, okay? I just have to recycle this for you. You're killing trees and nobody wants to read this, okay? That's number one. Number two, junior faculty, Stop doing the ad boards. You're getting paid a triviality of the amount of money the company is making by persuading you. The company's goal is not actually to solicit your feedback. It's very unlikely you're able to tell them something they don't already know. They are soliciting you because they want your allegiance and that's what that token payment is for. So don't do it. All right, Talquetamab, let's get into this. This is GPRC 5D. Ah, uh, the second one. Of course, Mylan Cody et al, GPRC 5D. car -T was the first one. This is the second, this is the bite, Janssen's bite. The rich get richer over at Janssen. They got, a, they got another product likely coming to market. Here's what they write in the introduction. They talk about the dire state of triple refractory myeloma. It's actually not that dire because if you have triple refractory myeloma, there are many, many, many other drugs that you could take and that, would, that might even benefit you based on randomized studies. There's pentarefractory, which we could say is actually a little bit worse. And then really when you talk about people who are refractory to seven prior lines and beyond, then I'll give you credit. Yeah, that's gonna be a dire population, but here they're talking about two and more as we're gonna to come to. And here's what they write. They say clinical benefit in the introduction. Recently approved therapies such as Selinexor, our favorite, Belantamab Mafodotin, Idacaptogene Vicolusil, and Siltacaptogene Autolusil have all shown clinical benefit. Hmm, is that the case? I think you've confused activity and benefits. The activity are drugs that generate responses in patients, and benefits are drugs that help people live longer and live better. One of those drugs, Blantamab Mafodotin, has actually been yanked off the U.S. market because it's unable to help people live longer and live better in a randomized control trial, to which some people say the control arm of Palmdex, which is an inferior control arm, was too strong and too hard to beat. That's crazy talk. Drugs have not established clinical benefit until they have beaten real standards of care. What about Selinexor? As far as I can tell, the only randomized trial to support Selly is a trial called Boston. And as far as I can tell, Boston is one of the worst studies ever done. So I would say Selly has also not established clinical benefit. Idacaptogene Vicoluso, it has a response rate in a PFS in an uncontrolled study, but there ain't no randomized data to show it's better than alternatives. And as last I checked, I think it's something like $40,000 per month of PFS, assuming that every month the PFS is attributable to the drug. That's the paper by David Russell, Jermaine, and myself. Uh, and I think that's a tall price to pay. So this is already wrong. The introduction, they already don't know the difference between activity, that means measures of tumor shrinkage, and efficacy and clinical benefit, which means living longer, living better. How do myeloma drugs come to market? I think we have to refresh our memory that if the drug has single agent activity, well, that's the way the companies like to bring it to market. We got teclistimab with 63% single agent activity, BCMA bite. We've got Selinexor, which had, you know, lousy single agent activity and has a lousy confirmatory study in Boston. Uh, and frankly, ha is, you know, the drug from hell. We have Belantamab, which is, whoops, off the U.S. market. We have Melflufin, which is, oh, also coming to be off the U.S. market. The company keeps fighting and fighting, but it's going to be coming off the U.S. market. Idacel, of course, is a tremendous price. The percentages I show you were the response rate of the drug in single agent studies on the left. The reason I've adjusted Idacel from 73 to 53 and Siltacel to 84, because the company doesn't count the denominator of people who get fereased and don't get cells. Now, if the drugs don't have single agent activity like panabinistat and ELO, they come on the basis of a randomized control trial. But this drug has single agent activity, so it's going to try to come based on that. Panabinistat, of course, also off the U.S. market. And ELO, of course, didn't work in the frontline setting. So myeloma, they're approving a lot of drugs. They're spending a lot of money, patient money, taxpayer money, insurance money, all society's money. But many of their drugs are falling, falling by the wayside. They're not succeeding. I noticed this about the manuscript. Medical writing assistance was provided by Janssen. Oh, well, that's good to know that 
These busy investigators don't even write their own papers. To me, you should not be promoted. It should be stricken from your CV. If you put a paper on there that you didn't write, you get a medical writer, you, you can't do it. You can't get a medical thinker. You, you can't get a medical writer to do your homework in grade school. You need to do your own work, okay? Writing is thinking and thinking is your job and you need to do that. You can't keep farming this out to pharma. This is really the death of academics. Here's what they say in the paper. This is a phase one, two study classic. Okay, I don't need to bore you with that. I'm gonna contend that many of these people have likely indolent biology, okay? The patients had received a median of six prior lines of therapy, range two to 20. Let me tell you something about multiple myeloma. If you've got a patient in your office who had 20 lines of therapy, yes, you can say to some degree, their longevity is to be credited to the therapy. That's partly true, but also to some degree, the fact that they lived long enough because of indolent biology was what allowed them to be exposed to so many different drugs. 20 lines of therapy is a hallmark of indolent biology. Two lines of therapy and you enroll me in a phase one study and that's a hallmark of an unethical investigator. That's actually a pretty shitty thing to do to somebody. I'm gonna talk about that. And this was over a median of 6.4 years since diagnosis. 79% had triple class refractory, 30% had pentarefractory. Phase one studies in myeloma should not be permitting people with two lines of therapy to enroll in a phase one, as we're going to talk about here when we look at the dose levels. This is terrible. Okay, they are really trying to present results for you in the what they call like the doses that are generating good response, 405 micrograms weekly, 800 micrograms every two weeks, the doses that they think are generating good responses, and they're going to try to push aside the uh, uh, hundreds of people that they've treated at lower doses and bury that in the supplement, but I've found a way to resuscitate that. We're gonna talk about that. What's to note here? You know, 90% have had a prior stem cell transplant. Uh, they mostly had six lines of therapy. I think there's a selection filter for indolent biology and also people who shouldn't be on a phase one when we have so many other active myeloma drugs. Um, people have gotten immunomodulatory drugs, proteasome inhibitors. Uh, in the supplement, of course, to their credit, they actually get a little bit better breakdown of what drugs they're getting. Um, and here they are. What do I think about this? I think that uh, if you're going to be doing uncontrolled studies in myeloma, you really need to be looking past the second line. You need to be looking in some really deep lines if you're gonna do uncontrolled studies. And you really need to do uncontrolled studies of phase one to establish the MTD and the carry forward dose. The moment you move into phase two, you need to be doing randomized phase two studies with the ability to quickly expand into phase three if you hit pre-specified targets and the ability to quickly collapse if you hit futility. Doing series of hundreds of hundreds of people in a series of uncontrolled phase two studies is partly why myeloma is this bizarre field where they have so many drugs and so little credible phase three data that actually tells you how you ought to sequence those drugs. These were the results. Okay, of the 30 people who got Alquetamab at 405 micrograms, you got a 70% response rate of the 44 people, you got a 64% response rate. I think it's actually pretty decent and probably in real life will surpass CAR T. Why? Because in CAR T, you have to wait for these companies to manufacture CAR T cells. They're not doing a good job of manufacturing CAR T cells because they're too busy using their manufacturing capacity to putting people on CAR T studies in early lines of therapy while people with relapse refractory, multiply relapse refractory myeloma who need CAR Ts, they're dying. So that's kind of a big screw up from a company standpoint. This is off the shelf. Much better. Nobody wants to be furiesing people and waiting around for the company to occasionally fail to make the product. This is going to be off the shelf is going to be the future. So anyone making these sort of, you know, CAR Ts in the lab, is, it's not going to be not likely to be successful in my opinion. Uh, dose escalation strategy. Let's not forget, the company is doing a very nice job, the company's medical writer, of not actually presenting to you the number of people who are getting this product at the very low doses. Phase one studies, they start low, and then they go up from there. What happens to these people at the low doses? This is an ethical question. You have some people in this study who've gotten two prior lines of therapy. Let's say they got VRD, and then they got Daravelcade dex Then they enroll in this study and then they get assigned to the lowest level dose, the homeopathic doses in the phase one study. That is negligent medicine. That's a person that you could be giving carfilzomib to, you could be giving a slew of other active anti-cancer drugs, POM to, you could be giving so many different triplets to that person. You've enrolled them in a phase one study after two prior lines and they're getting a homeopathic dose. That's bad. You are likely shortening their survival. You're killing them for your study because you're enrolling them in your phase one and you really shouldn't be enrolling people with two prior lines of therapy. Very inappropriate. And I would even say triple class should no longer be in phase one. Inappropriate. There are too many lines you can get through. Remember, 232 people were treated on this, not just the 30 and 44 they focus on at the good doses, but the people who got the lower doses. That's the nature of a phase one. 
and 130 have progressive disease. I've cropped these tables from the supplement just to remind us that these are human beings who are enrolling in this study. And then somebody has got four people and they're giving a five microgram dose to, and lo and behold, the response rate is a 0%. 15 micrograms, 0%. One person responded out of six, and who knows if it's even, you know, how credible this is, 16%. And now we're finally getting to 50% response. These people are being harmed, okay? You take somebody with two prior lines and you put them on this homeopathic dose, it's unethical. IRBs should have halted this design feature and said, we have to take people who have truly failed you can't have it both ways. You can't say myeloma, we have an abundance of riches. And at the same time, somebody who had only two prior lines of therapy is so desperate that they auto enroll in a phase one. You can't have it both ways. You are putting them on very negligent care here. Okay, not good, not good. Somebody should have pointed this out to you when you're designing your trial. Now you have a big problem, I think, an ethical problem. Uh, when you look at the IV medication, you got the same problem. You've got half a microgram per kilogram every other week dosing, 0% response rate. I mean, this is not good. There are a lot of people not responding at the low levels. I didn't have the time to tabulate it all, but I'd love for somebody, a listener plenary session, put it in the, the response here. All the dose levels they're not highlighting in the original publication, what is the response rate across all those dose levels? Might even be worse than Selinexor, which is already terrible. Um, toxicity. You're going to have to pay a price with this drug. I mean, I see a lot of hematologic toxicity. You're talking 87% grade 3, 4, 86%, 90% grade 3, 4. And that's not, uh, that's a little bit of a downside. I mean, you know, this drug may have a role in relapse refractory myeloma, but bringing it up front with that kind of grade 3, 4, and look at what it does to your counts. It's bottom, bottoming it out, bottoming it out. And leukopenia, pretty bad. Opportunistic affections occurred in two patients. That's the way the investigators are scoring it. But in randomized studies, you'll learn the truth about opportunistic infections, which I don't think are going to be good for teclistimab. And I don't think it's going to be good for talquetamab either. I don't think it's going to be good in opportunistic infections. So, uh, the skin. The skin. The skin is going to be a problem for this drug. Why? Because GPRC5D is expressed on the skin. And as you give this to more and more people, you're going to find that that toxicity is bad. They made a change in this study, I think. I read very quickly that they modified the MTD stopping rules to permit the administration of glucocorticoids initially for rash so that they could try to get at higher dose levels because it, the rash was going to be the DLT. Uh, that's not good. You know, rash has been the bane of many drugs existence, including cetuximab and GPRC 5C, 5D expression on skin uh, is going to be a problem. I think that's my guess. Corroboration of these initial findings is underway in a phase two study. This is how the authors conclude uh, that we're going to take this response rate we see and move it again into a phase two study. You know what? Enough with your phase two studies. You need a randomized study now. You need to take people with relapse refractory myeloma and randomize them in the United States to a true investigator choice or whatever this is. You know, that's the study you need to do. The primary endpoint needs to be overall survival. And guess what? With pentarefractory patients, that's the target of your study. You can power it for overall survival quite easily. And it won't take you that long because overall survival is, per your own admission, quite brisk. So in fact, you can do it. In fact, it's probably going to be even faster than response rate. See, what people don't realize, what they confuse is the experience of the individual and the experience of the aggregate. The experience of the individual is individuals have responses and they progress and then they die, typically. The aggregate of a trial is different. When you enroll people in a study that seeks to ascertain the response rate, you're just enrolling, 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 and people at different points in time are responding, 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 then you follow them for the DOR, duration of response, and that'll take different periods of time. And the overall study time is the enrollment period, the response period, plus the follow-up DOR period. In a randomized study, you're always randomizing people as you're enrolling them, and you're following them for the primary endpoint of survival, which is accruing all the time. And, e and it is possible in relapse refractory settings that the randomized trial would have yielded a faster result than had you looked at response rate. And in fact, these are some examples. STORM, uncontrolled study. Boston controlled. Those are the raw number differences in the time it takes from enrollment to study halt. Horizon Ocean, 37, 44 months. We've done this for so many things. Uh, 15 months, 16 months, 36 months, 21 months, 48 months, 41 months. Random, Non-randomized studies don't save time. You are just tolerating lower levels of credibility and evidence. And the crisis in myeloma is not that we don't know which drugs have activity. The crisis is we don't know. We know very little about how to sequence these drugs to optimize survival and quality of life. The investigators are so confused. 
that they've confused activity for clinical benefit. They don't even understand the difference. Drugs that lower M protein are active drugs. They're promising. They should be studied in randomized studies looking at overall survival and quality of life. And when a drug like Belantamab fails to beat POMDEX, it fails to beat POMDEX. It's not equivalent to POMDEX when you run a superiority study that fails to succeed because it's not an equivalent study. That's a different type of study design you didn't run. Bottom line, bottom line on TAC and GPRC 5D. Two prior lines of therapy is inappropriate for a phase one. Anyone who takes a myeloma patient who's got two prior lines and puts them on a low level dose in this trial is an unethical investigator. That was really, really bad. You wouldn't have done that to your own mother. You've delayed the time. You made them you know, waste their time when you could have given them many, many drugs that were life prolonging. That's bad. Shame on you for that. Change your phase one criteria. Stop enrolling people early. Okay, you're out of your minds. There's a reason why we don't do cancer phase ones in healthy people like we do for heartburn medicines, okay? Because there is a price to be paid. And do you really want to take people who have really exhausted all proven options? You can't use PFS and overall survival and DOR from a single arm, multiple relapse population. It's not even comparable to the cohorts because these are the people whose parameters are so exquisitely suited. They got 20 lines of therapy, but they're still trial eligible. Who is this person? Indolent biology and good substrate. You can't compare them to any sort of registry. Phase two studies to better understand response rate are stupid. I can promise you right now the response rate is in the 60 to 80% ballpark. That's a ballpark that we need randomized studies. You do more phase two response rate studies, you're wasting my time and you're wasting the time of myeloma patients. You're actually depriving them of information they need for their care. We need randomized studies with good control arms, no more unethical control arms. No time is saved by you doing these response rate studies. You actually don't understand the difference between individual and trial level. And you should read the paper by uh, Emerson Chen and myself in Gem Internal Medicine, where we have proven to you that it actually doesn't save time. Skin and hair toxicity, not so good. That is the bane of many drugs, and it will be bad. Uh, neutropenia, opportunistic infections, not good. If you combine this with uh, uh, BCMA bites, I think, ticlistimab and this, that's going to not be good for your, for your immune system. Okay, not good. Off the shelf is good. You got that from me. Off the shelf, I like that. And the price is bound to be bad. All right, so in conclusion, don't hang, hang bags of recycling on my door. Number two, don't go to these ad boards. They are, you're really just selling away your credibility for token sums of money, and you're not going to be giving them any useful information, and you're very likely being detailed. You don't even know it. And three, this is the nature of the study. Phase one, mm, some mistakes made along the way. Now it needs a randomized study. Uh, I would do I would do a simple randomized study. Phase starts as a phase two. Many rules for futility, especially when the infection risk is bad. Then immediately goes to phase three. Why? Because even if you have a response rate, it's very possible that you'll be like a belantamab. You'll have you'll fail to have improved overall survival, or like a melflufen, you'll actually have worse overall survival because you have no way to weigh the toxicity and the benefit in an uncontrolled study. Okay, that's why you need randomization. Those are my thoughts. This is the first of many Ash videos. I didn't have as much time as I like. I don't have my video set up, but. Better than nothing, I say. Better than nothing. Until next time.